ടി ലേഖകരും പ്രവർത്തകരെ അധ്യാപകരെ വിദ്യാർത്ഥികൾ ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് എൻ ഓണർ ടു ഹോസ് മിസ്റ്റർ പ്രകാശ് അംബേദ്കർ എ ടോൾ ഫിയർ ഇൻ ദ ഇന്ത്യൻ സോഷ്യൽ ആൻഡ് പൊളിറ്റിക്കൽ സീൻ ടുഡേ വി ആർ ബെസ്റ്റ് ടു ഹാവ് ഹി വിത്ത് എസ് ടുഡേ താങ്ക് യു ഫോർ ടേക്കിംഗ് ടൈം ഔട്ട് ഓഫ് യുവർ ബിസി ഷെഡ്യൂൾ സർ ദിനം നന്മയും സ്നേഹവും ബഹുമാനവുമുള്ളൊരു ആശയമാണ് മറ്റ് യാതൊരു താല്പര്യവുമില്ലാതെ ജനസേവനത്തിനിറങ്ങിയ ഒരു കൂട്ടായ്മക്ക് ദിശാബോധം നൽകിയ വലിയ മനുഷ്യരെ ഓർക്കുകയാണ് ദയാപുരം ഇന്ന് ആ ഈ കൂട്ട ഒത്തുചേരൽ അനുഗ്രഹീതമാണ് എന്ന് ഞാൻ വിചാരിക്കുന്നു അങ്ങനെ ആവാൻ വേണ്ടി പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു വലിയ മനുഷ്യരെ അറിയാൻ കഴിയുന്നതും അവരിൽ നിന്ന് പഠിക്കാൻ കഴിയുന്നതും വളരെ ഭാഗ്യം ഉള്ള കാര്യമാണ് നമ്മെ കൂടുതൽ നല്ലവരും അറിവുള്ളവരും അർപ്പണവാദമുള്ളവരുമാക്കി മാറ്റണം എന്ന് ഞാൻ വിചാരിക്കുന്നു അവരും വിദ്യാർത്ഥികളെ സംബന്ധിച്ച് പറയുകയാണെങ്കിൽ ഇതിൻ്റെ പൂർവ്വ ചരിത്രം മാനേജ്മെൻറ് സ്റ്റാഫിനെ ഇവിടെ പറഞ്ഞു കഴിഞ്ഞു ആ അന്ന് മുതൽ ഇന്നുവരെ നമ്മുടെ കുട്ടികളുടെ സജീവ പങ്കാളിത്തം ഇവിടുന്ന് വിട്ടു കഴിഞ്ഞാലും ദയാവൃത്തിന് ഉണ്ടായിക്കൊണ്ടിരിക്കുന്നുണ്ട് എല്ലാ നന്മകളും നേർന്നുകൊണ്ട് ഞാൻ നിർത്തുന്നു and the members of the governing body of this various Dayapuram wonderful institution. Also, Dr. Ashley, for being after me for nearly three months that I should come and visit the institution. Respectable members on the Dayas, and uh, some of them whom i had an opportunity of meeting and interaction with them and with the dedication application and commitment to certain principles which they follow i salute them and i thank them for carrying on the message that reverence is the only way of salvation i know that they come from a family where a thought process or you may say so building of a modern society begins a number of time i have to address this issue and uh, people keep on asking me is how is that that from baker after going through all these torturous life right from the school days this no way in his writing and in speeches or in his action he has either spoken of of revenge he has either spoken of hurting the society or even joining hands with those forces who had opposed his progress my grandfather i can say so was a believer that individual is not bad individuality is also not bad but the individual within the system either makes it good or either makes it bad if the system is bad he said the human being is bad 
If the system is good, then they said that system makes the human being good. And therefore, after framing the constitution, when somebody asked him, you are the first man to go against the constitution, he said, yes. And he said, I wanted to install the God within the temple of constitution. But instead of God, he said the devil has taken over the constitution. And therefore, beginning from here, what he said that between bad and evil, he spoke of systems. And therefore, first thing what he wanted in his life is that systems should change. The way of thinking, the way of life should change. And unless and until we change the way of life, unless and until we change the system, neither he said humanity is going to change, nor he said human value is going to be respected in this society. Dr. Ambedkar himself being a follower of Kabir, because he, in the olden days people were known by whatever saint he followed. So you had the Ramdasi Pant, you had the Kabir Dasi Pant, so many others. You have the Pashveshwar today, uh, Pashveshwar Pant. So people were known by these Pants. So he was basically a Kabir Panti. And therefore, in the olden days, the family would family majority of the Indian families, you can say, they had to decide whatever uh, saying they followed, the verses which was followed. So he was also well versed in all those uh, verses. And therefore he made his three gurus in his life. Two we know very well. Mahatma Phule was one of his gurus. He said that I have three gurus in my life. One was Mahatma Phule. The second, he said, was Buddha. And the third, which very well, which is not known, is that Kabi was his guru. So he said, these are three gurus whom I look for, not only so that, but also whenever I am agitated, I look upon the spiritual person to find out the way and the process in which not only the humanity, but also the society can change. So one of the first important principles that he taught and gave to the society is that we must not be self-centered. Because once we become self-centered, then we become selfish. And once selfishness comes in, then we start into an exploitive society. And therefore, you always refer to the Indian society as a divided society between two schools of thought. And that's two schools of thought. I said one, he be, one which he belonged to was the Kavipanti school of thought, which is known as the saint religion in this country. And the other one which was known as, if I may say so, is the Manuvadi school of thought in this country. He was against the Manu Manuvadi school of thought and therefore he wanted to reform the um, society on a line of the saintly religion so that humanity becomes the focal point in the society. Many persons have different opinions about Dr. Vinkar. One of them is he says that he didn't believe in religion either. Yes, it is true. He made a difference between uh, religion. Religion in the sense which is dogmatic religion, he said, I don't believe dogmatic religion. But I believe in a religion which is a changing religion. And therefore he used the word for, the, for religion is dharma and not dharma. He said dharma and dharma both have different meanings. When we use the word dharma, he said there is a dogmatic. When we use the word dharma, he says basically a changing 
religion which changes according to time. Only the essence of the religion remains as it is. In the Indian, Indian society, we have three persons who very openly canvassed that religion is necessary in life. One was Mahatma Gandhi, second was Mahatma Phule, and third was Dr. Ambedkar, who said that whatever we are going to be draft thing through the constitution is to regulate the life of a person, human being. To regulate the life as to how we are going to be governed. To regulate the economy of the society. To regulate what is not going to be the exploitive system of the country. But they said who is going to regulate the individual himself? Either the individual has to regulate himself or he has to look upon some person to regulate himself. And that some person which they said is going to be a religion which is going to which is going to regulate the society and which is regulate which is going to regulate the human beings. He said religion means a set of principles which doesn't say just do's and don'ts, but builds in humanitarian value and also at the same time doesn't teach us to despise another human being, to treat others as unequal, who doesn't teach us that we should not respect the other human beings. He said religion basically helps people to understand humanity, to build in humanity and to live by humanity, to live by brother, to accept each other's individuality, to respect each other's view, even we are going to differ. And today what he said is that tolerance, as I may say, say I mean if I may say so today, the question is that the tolerant society, which was a tolerant society, is now becoming an intolerant society. And that is where the crisis begins within the society. I have never considered political crisis as a very serious crisis. Political crises are like a bubble in the water. As long as there is air in the bubble, the bubble is visible to our eyes. But once the air flows down, the bubble gets merged into the water and it becomes standstill as it is. But the social unrest due to intolerance in the society breeders within us hatred and to get over hatred it becomes a very difficult task and therefore in one of his articles he, he uh, Dr. Ambedkar mentions that at any given time when we have crisis in the society or in the nation what is necessary he said was a person who can who can command, confident of both sides or three sides, four sides, whatever it may be. And if you don't have a person who can command a confidence of any of the intolerant side, he said there are definitely going to be crashes and there, there, there he said the crisis begins in the society. Today I see we are in the midst of crisis. I was talking to the younger generation today in the morning and uh, I was repeating the same thing what Dr. Ambedkar said. Because he said that this constitution after 25 years, according to me, if it is implemented, will need to be changed. 
And one of the reasons why, when I look back and see it, why did he make this statement is because our concept of development has not grown. It may be social development, it may be economical development, it may be humanitarian development. Any angle, if you, if you see, our issue of development has not changed at all. We look at development in a static sense. Today, the development process has to begin. And when we say that the development process has to begin, we have to look at the views of the younger generation. That's what I feel. Because he said that after every 20 years, 25 years, there's going to be a new generation. And he said, new generation is a nation. And this new nation is going to have into going to have its own school of thought. If we recognize the new school of thought, he said there is not going to be any conflict. But if we are not going to recognize the new school of thought, then the conflicts begin. And he said conflict begins not within the society, but it begins within the family. Well, it's a clash of two different schools of thought. One which is becoming progressive and the one who says no, the buck should stop here and no further. So this is a place I think so where we need to understand and therefore I've said, I've said that it's my reverence to the management committee who has not fallen a prey to the present conflict which is taking place in this society. It's a religious conflict, it's a social conflict and also a reservation conflict. And I look at this conflict in a sense when there are so many groups within the society who are clamoring for reservation. It means that our thinking process, it means that our development process, it means a change which the society needs, we are not able to articulate. We are not able to address to it and therefore everybody is trying to move itself or get itself squeezed into the queue of reservation. The concept of reservation which came into this society was that those who feel who are left out will be assured that they will not be left out. Those who clamor for reservation it will only be said that okay we will take care of you. But taking care doesn't mean development. Today you need to have a total new sense of developmental agenda for the nation. As the society is progressing at the same time, but due to shortage of space, there is even again a conflict for the peace itself. Who can enter that space, he is happy. Those who has not entered that space, he is blaming each other. And therefore, what we look at orphanage, what we look at people, those who are left out, I think so that same principle is now need to be looked for the whole society as a such. Opportunity should be made available to all. Today we have a primary education which at least on paper we say that any student who wants to get an admission is entitled for admission. Any student who wants to get into primary education, yes, he can get into an uh, he can get into a primary education. What we are not addressing today is the secondary education system which we have or the higher education system that we have. And that's where I find the social conflict is being exploited by the regressive forces in this country. The religious forces in this country. Opening up these spaces for the secondary and for the higher education I think so is one of the most important tasks 
of the society. But once we open up the doors for them, the conflict within the society that takes place at their age is at us. We have limited number of seats for medical admission. We have a limited number of seats for engineering. RT is a little better position, I may say, to, say so today. But if you see, look at the other branches. The other branches are controlled. They are limited seats. The population in the age group of 15 to 20 is to the tune of 27%. And this is an educational population. This is an age where, where, the, where this population is taking education. And at this educational stage, if you are going to make them fight against each other, make them compete with each other, they are going to develop some kind of animosity towards each other. And if this animosity is exploited by somebody, this animosity turns into hatred and that is what we see in the society. The problem is one of the institutions, I think so, this should be a forward institution. It should take up a lead. That for a higher education, those who are intelligent, those who are intelligent, they should have a choice of education, irrespective of his caste, creed and religion. Given education of his choice is going to 90% address the issue like today. Socially, the students are moving out, they have their own groups, Cutting across caste line, cutting across religion line, cutting across whatever language you belong to. They are moving out. But the movement gets restricted once he has to start choosing his field of life. And once he has to start choosing his field of life, and if he finds that he is not accommodated, then he becomes anti towards the society. And this antiness needs to be addressed to me. And this emptiness can be addressed, as I say so, is by having a, by giving these students a choice of education. It is not going to become a burden on the government because when it when the constitution was drafted and somebody asked Dr. Ambedkar why did you uh, did not convert the primary education into a fundamental right and making it responsibility that the state will be responsible for giving fundamental education to the students is a resource was the crunch. Today there is no such crunch with the state governments. We may say after 70 years we are a better off and a well placed society. The society is in a position to bear the education of this what we are spending today 3 to 4 percent on the uh, secondary education needs to be increased to 8 percent I, I think so that can take care of take care of the whole education of the society. The second what we are with what we are imbibing into the society I think so is the competitiveness and this competitiveness is eating into his human values. When we attended the schools, we ever say it, it was like absolutely like the government paid for us. Today it is like the family paying for these uh, students' uh, education. And at every stage, he is made, being made aware that he is paying for the education. 
So that's an investment that is being made by the family. Therefore, once he takes the education and comes out, is one of his first motive become that what has been invested in the education should be drawn back, should be earned back. And since his motive then becomes that it should be done, it should be returned back, the human values becomes the casualty and earning money becomes his own thing. Earning makes him both inhuman and corrupt, both. When we speak of a society which says that it should be a free society, it should be a non-corrupt society, we have to see that the foundation of the society itself is not corrupt. If at a tender age the student is made aware that his parents are paying for the education, for the higher education, this much has been invested, then his motive becomes that what has been invested has to be earned back. The right, left and center without, therefore I said, without having any human values, his only motive becomes earning for the society, earning for himself at the cost of the society. Therefore, what is embodied today, the fruits are their future. And today we are seeing a corrupt society. And this corrupt society has all along been working in this class and this is what Dr. Medgar said that if you want to have a future society which is your own, he said you must learn to invest in it. Unless and until we start investing in the new society, in the younger generation, you are not going to have a better society which is going to be humanitarian. And therefore which is one of the, one of the areas I think so where uh, we have to take a stand that education is going to be for all, those who have the talent, they must have a choice of education. And once we give the choice of education, I think so the, the unrest that we see in the society, by the next generation, this unrest will be evaporated and you will have a peace in the society. The next issue which I would like to deal is, you can't have emptiness at an age in which a population is productive. A productive population is both destructive as well as positive. If you have to make it a positive one, we have to see that he is in a gainful employment. Because once he is in a gainful employment, his thought process begins in that line, in that direction that he has to be positive. In his productive age, if he is empty-headed, then he becomes into a destructive society. And he himself develops into a destructive society and becomes the fodder for the reactionary forces in this country. The reactionary forces in this country are not going to die, let me tell you. They are not just going to evaporate. But this is a cultural social conflict of who is to prevail and who is not to prevail. There is a class within the society who doesn't want to change who says that the old system has to continue. And they want the old system to continue because that gives them the hegemony over the system and over the human beings. They are not ready to sacrifice this hegemony. They are not ready to sacrifice the privileges given which, was, which they got from the older, gender, older system. And therefore they are going to keep on agitating. Their agitation will be valueless as long as we have the younger generation into a productive, positive, productive sector.
But as long as they are in the productive sector, these forces are going to remain not only dormant, but they are going to remain, remain ineffective at the same time. When we look at the younger generation, I think so. We have to look at the younger generation because they are the future of the nation. We have to look at the present generation because it is their needs which have to be looked at. What we are doing today is we are looking at the present generation, ignoring the future generation. Both things should go, both things should go hand to hand. It is not that we leave one and look after the other. And that is the one of the most, that is what I said. Why Dr. Ambedkar stands out amongst all? It's because he's he spoke and uh, he spoke, he not only spoke but he developed the system which has remained evergreen and which has which has relevant even after 70 years of our independence. Because he spoke of individual freedom which today everybody would like to have. We had a joint family system. At one period of time, joint family system was one of the necessities of a life. But in today's situation, slowly by slowly you see the joint family are becoming into a nuclear family. And one of the reasons why we have a nuclear family is because the individuality needs to be recognized and individual freedom is also necessary at the same time. So Dr. Ambedkar spoke of individual and individual freedom. And therefore we say that the imposition that was imposition that was being made, we deny those imposition. Today we say, no, I would like to lead a life which I want. But at the same time I say that I leading my life should not should not disturb the other person's life or my neighbor's life. I think so this is where the whole situation as I see stands today. The third issue, which I may say so, is a religious issue. The essence of all religion is going to remain intact. Hindi may just from the Gaba kete, Gaba maklim, it's a main part. Nucleus, as we say. The nucleus of every religion is going to remain as it is. But with the passage of time, the other parts are going to remain, are going to change. What needs to be changed, I think so, that is where the society has to decide. And society must allow those changes to take place. If you don't allow those changes to take place, then we have a religious conflict as we see today. There's a, there's a big religious problem. I'm in admiration of this present government that they have at least seen to it that within the priesthood, the monopoly of the priesthood has been set aside and others have been allowed into the priesthood. That is a force change I can see. It's a change by force. But I do admire that change has come. And I further admire that those who are in the monopoly over the priesthood have, have, have accepted that we need to change and we need to integrate the whole society. 